Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Laura Barnes, Executive Director of the Great Lakes Regional Pollution Prevention Roundtable. Um, before we get going, I just want to give you a few housekeeping notes. Presentation slides are available for download on the Glipper website. That's www.glipper.org, and they're on the meetings page. Um, there should be a link in your chat window to those, um, although the, don't use the top link because GoToMeeting appended the pyramid at the end of the link and it won't work. So the correct link is, is one chat message down. Um, I'd also like to remind everyone about our upcoming webinar on June 18th. Natalie Hummel and Kathy Davey of US EPA will be talking about how to use EPA's pollution prevention, greenhouse gas, and cost calculators to measure environmental outcomes. So today, I am pleased to welcome Myla Kelly, who's going to explain how Montana has applied the Energy, Economy, and Environment Technical Assistance Framework, which is other, otherwise known as E3, to the agricultural sector. Myla is the coordinator of the Peaks to Prairies Pollution Prevention Center. In cooperation with EPA Region 8 states, Peaks to Prairies encourages adoption of pollution prevention practices by citizens, businesses, and local governments. And um, Peaks to Prairies is also our Region 8 partner in the um, P2RX National Pollution Prevention Information Network. Myla also co-chairs the Tribal Pollution Prevention Work Group, whose mission is to work collaboratively with tribes throughout the U.S. in reducing the environmental and health risks associated with the generation of waste on tribal lands. Myla has a B.S. in biology from Tufts University and an M.S. in forestry resource conservation from the University of Montana. She served as the riparian ecologist for the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission and has worked as a private consultant on fisheries, watershed planning, and waste reduction efforts throughout the West for the past 15 years. With that, I'll, um, I've turned the controls over to Myla. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, please submit them using the questions pane on the GoToWebinar control panel on your screen. Um, there are several places in, during the presentation where we'll pause to um, ask for questions and comments, and then um, I'll read those and have Myla respond. So take it away, Myla. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Laura. I am so happy to be here, and thank you all for joining me and listening in about this um, this initiative that we have begun in Montana. And um, and I always <laughs> I like these webinars because it's it's great to be able to reach out to folks across the country without always having to travel together or you know travel to to get together. But I really like talking to people when I can look in their eyes. So I always find this webinar thing a little bit odd because I'm just we're just talking into this black box, but I guess it's got its pros and cons. And so thank you so much for um, for being patient and, and for joining us today. Um, I, um, I'm going to figure out how to change my slides, and then I'm going to start talking. Okay, so as Laura mentioned, um, I'm the coordinator of the Peaks to Prairies Pollution Prevention Center, which is a partner um, with Glipper, uh, we work in um, we work primarily in or primarily in Region Eight, which are the states of North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado, in providing pollution prevention outreach. Um, and we do that um, via the Pollution Prevention um, Funding Act of 1990. And so um, we've been doing various initiatives um, that fall under the Pollution Prevention Act for, for a number of years. Um, and But the particular initiative that we're going to talk about today is, is E3, Economy, Energy, Environment. Um, Let's see. I, our, um, our center is located, just as a little bit of background, at Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana. We are a part of the university um, within the Extension Division. So um, within Extension, there is a, a particular department called the Housing and Environmental Health Department, and we work under, um, we work within that department within Extension within the Land Grant University of, um, of Montana State University. Um, I've managed our Pollution Prevention Center for a little over four years now and what I really love most about it is is convening the professionals that have a vested interest in in whatever the particular issue is that we're talking about um, convening those those professionals to learn from one another and with this particular initiative um, those partners would be our um, energy efficiency and pollution prevention experts um, along with our ag producers and the various ag interests that that exist um, through our federal and state partners so I'm not sure who um, who you guys all are out there, but I'm just going to give a quick 
um, overview of what E3 is before I, I talk about what our role or what a, a potential role could be for you to um, in the ag sector. So E3 is a multi-federal partner initiative that's taking place nationwide for the purpose of working with communities to connect small and medium-sized manufacturers with experts from federal agencies, states, and regions. Um, this looks different for each community. In each, in, in each E3 community, there are teams that are formed to, um, to conduct very customized technical assessments and offer, pra offer practical, sustainable approaches that manufacturers can incorporate into their operations. Um, the goal of these assessments are to reduce energy consumption, to minimize carbon footprints, to prevent pollution, increase productivity, and drive innovation throughout each facility. So when this, um, this concept of E3 began, it began within, um, within the realm of manufacturing. Um, the, the federal partners that participate in E3 um, and that have signed memorandums of understanding to, um, to participate in, in whatever um, whatever way they, they best can, um, include the Department of Commerce, the Department of Energy, US EPA, the Department of Labor, USDA, and SBA. There are a number um, of E3 facilities or communities that have, um, that have begun to use this framework around the country. And you can see here is just a snapshot from the E3 web page that shows um, what some of the different initiatives are that are going on around the country. So USDA, as I um, was one of the recent federal partners added to this framework. And they're a bit unsure as to what their role could be in this EE3 framework since it had historically been um, driven by manufacturing. Um, and meanwhile, I've been present for years of this discussion as E3 was kind of being rolled out. And I wondered how best E3 could benefit our particular state and our particular region and what our role could potentially be in that. Um, agriculture is one of the largest economic sectors in our region, meaning EPA's Region 8, and over the half of the land area in Region 8 is devoted to ag. We're a big, large land-based uh, region, and so it makes sense that, um, that a lot of our, one of our largest dr economic drivers is ag. Um, when we talk about Montana specifically, it's closer to two-thirds of our land acres are devoted to agriculture. The rest is federal state lands, and then we've got some communities thrown in there too, but, but really it's very heavily ag-based. We have close to 30,000 farms in Montana, um, averaging a couple of thousand acres each. So we do still have a relatively um, small, um, small-sized farms, I guess, you small to mid-sized farms. Um, for each ag energy operation cost, for each ag operation, energy costs are a significant portion of the operating costs. So ag is important. Lowering energy costs is important, and our environment's important. And that was the backdrop to kind of developing this pilot in E3 and ag. Um, we began some initial discussions in the spring of 2012. We began um, formulating this, um, this team, this E3 team. Um, through a grant, um, a source reduction grant in 2012, uh, the objective of which was to conduct hands-on E3 assessments for ag producers. Um, at following the award of this grant, it was um, we started off with a bang with just lots of different coordination pieces, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and in the fall of 2012, we were awarded an additional source reduction grant to take our pilot pilot efforts and. and evolve those into a larger statewide effort. Um, through this project development and through our meetings, particularly with USDA partners, we came up with this overarching goal. And um, the goal is really simple. There's no rocket science behind it. But it's really important because it was critical in designing the rest of our project. And that goal was to ensure that by participating in E3, we've put our agricultural producers in the best position possible to maximize available financial opportunities in order to implement E3 recommendations. So the point of E3 is to develop energy efficiency and pollution prevention recommendations. Um, but that's not really the point. The point is to get those implemented and some to actually realize some environmental and some energy costs. And so in order to successfully do this within the agricultural sector, it was really important to ensure that these recommendations could actually go somewhere and that they could actually um, take our producers 
put our producers in a position where they could um, where they could leverage some some low cost loans, some grant opportunities, whatever that was, we needed it to ensure that the, our E3 Ag assessments were meeting the highest bar possible for funding opportunities. So in order to do that, we needed to figure out what that highest bar was. So how do we make it happen? Um, there are three key components here. One is finding willing producers. We need farmers and landscapes to work with. We need access to farmers' land and their operations. And there's a trust issue here. When I list out our federal E3 partners, that doesn't necessarily elicit a sigh of relief from many of our agricultural producers. Um, our Montana farmers, as yours are, are dealing with old regulations, new regulations, changing regulations, disappearing farm bills, reappearing versions of a farm bill. And while I'm not advocating one way or the other on any of those particular regulations, we do need to recognize that that exists and that there can be an understandable trust hurdle. Um, the second is conducting the assessments. Once we've identified folks to work with, we need boots on the ground. So these assessments and audits and write-ups take a ton of time. And, um, and in order to get the most environmental kind of bang for our buck, we need a bunch of people working on this. Um, and number three is securing in implementation dollars. Um, the audits have got to be beneficial for those willing to participate. Otherwise, you're not going to get the farmer talking across the fence or at the stock growers meeting. Um, saying, hey, you should participate in this E3 assessment. If there's no benefit to the producer, it's going to be pretty dead in the water. Um, one of those benefits is being able to secure opportunities to cost share or otherwise assist in the investment of implementing energy efficiency audit recommendations. So that's what we figured out we need to do. And then we started looking at just the landscape of different partners um, that participate in E3 or that have anything to do with energy efficiency, ag production, pollution prevention. And we started looking at all of these different logos and people and human beings and, and trying to figure out how do you solve the, prob the, the challenge of gaining trust, of getting the boots on the ground, and getting farmers bought in. And this is where I really think that this, the E3 in ag model that we've developed, um, and that is utilizing the existing talents as well as training and working with our land-grant university extension agents and professionals can be widely and successfully used and replicated. Um, it really revolves around capitalizing on a century's worth of extension work. Um, extension has the... Um, the mission to bring science, engineering, and ag research to the people of the state, the common folk, as it was stated in the late 1800s. Um, Montana State University in every state has an, um, a cooperative extension service, but it varies a little bit from state to state as far as um, whether there's a particular agent in each county or whether that's um, lumped by um, regions. You know, it's a little bit different state by state, but basically, um, well, in Montana, for example, we have professionals in each county that are in place um, to help our Montana ag producers and landowners increase profits, reduce loss, protect our food supply, and sustain future resources. So you can see there's really a lot of overlap between the overarching E3 goals, our overarching goal, and the goal of, of, of cooperative extension service. What's really critical is that extension has an established trust relationships with producers. And the, as a result, they are really essential in, number one, finding producers that are willing to participate in an E3 assessment. Um, number two, communicating the benefits of an E3 assessment and subsequent implementation of recommendations. And number three, being able to communicate those successful outcomes to other producers in the state. So they're really kind of the linchpin. Um, and it's through this cooperative extension partnership that I believe that this E3 and Ag concept is hopefully going to be um, and seems to be starting to take off in our state. Um, there's a few other really key partnerships, um, particularly with um, the USDA programs. One's with NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, one's with Rural Development. The other's with um, FSA, the um, Farm Service Agency. So I want to talk quickly about those. Um, NRCS conservationists are also um, 
you know, through, located throughout the state. Um, and I, I believe that's the same um, nationwide, but they have field offices that serve counties, um, almost every county in each state. Um, the wonderful thing about NRC, well, there's a number of wonderful things about NRCS, but NRCS has developed numerous technical tools, which are very important and, and were ex extremely useful in, um, in, in conducting an E3 assessment for ag. Um, some of these technical tools, and I'll show you a couple of them in a minute, include the cropland energy estimator that is important in calculating many of these E3 metrics. Um, NRCS also has funding sources, such as the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Um, we determined that this program, which is called EQIP, or um, dubbed EQIP, is the highest bar that I mentioned earlier. There's a lot of funding that goes to the EQIP programs, and it's also quite challenging. Um, uh, they, they require um, very specific technical specifications in order to qualify for cost match opportunities. And so it's, it's a relatively large funding pot, um, and, they, and the, the, um, the bar for um, being eligible for that funding pot is pretty high. And so we determined that this was kind of our highest bar, and that all of our E3 assessments were going to meet this NRCS EQIP requirement. Um, and this will come through in a little bit later as well. Um, the Rural Development Program of USDA is, um, is an additional very strong partnership. Um, they have a couple of grant opportunities that are just um, sort of made for these um, for this type of these, the type of recommendations that result from an E3 assessment, um, these grant and loan opportunities include the rural, the Renewable Energy for America, the REAP program, the Value Added Producer grants that they have, and loan guarantee programs. Um, the Farm Services Agency is another um, component of USDA that makes guaranteed loans to family farmers and ranchers to promote, build, and sustain family farms in support of a thriving agricultural economy. Their particular program um, that is a good fit for E3 recommendations is their guaranteed conservation loan, which provides a maximum loan amount of over a million dollars to implement any conservation practice in an NRCS-approved conservation plan. So we go back to that bar again because in order to qualify for an FSA, Guaranteed Conservation Loan, um, the producer will have had to have created an NRCS approved conservation plan. So even though there are different components of USDA, um, again, you, you would have, a producer would have had to go through the process of an NRCS approved plan to be approved for an FSA loan. So um, again, it was important to, to do our homework with this up front. Um, USDA was a new agency that I hadn't worked with too much in the past. So kind of sorting this all out, um, it, 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 took, it took some time. And, and understanding um, how they work together and how they were organized took, took a bit of time. So we began by um, soliciting applications. So we're back to you know step one, getting our um, getting our cooperative extension service agents trained up and, and getting out there. So we solicited um, six agents, and we've gone past the pilot now. So I think we're about up to twelve. Um, and now we needed to train them. Um, they have all kinds of background in you know soil conservation and. Um, and weed management, and you know, each extension agent kind of has their own specialty. But we needed to train them in all aspects of on-farm energy efficiency. Um, we needed to find a producer. They so, after, in doing so, and in signing on to be an agent with our program, with our um, with our program, they agreed to that they would be trained, that they would find a producer in their area who is interested and willing to have an assessment or audit completed. They agreed to conduct the assessment, and they agreed to work with a contractor that we had um, that we had um, contracted with to complete an assessment report that would qualify under NRCS, NRCS requirements. So we did that, and we had a, we had our first training that was last year, and then we these are these dots represent um, where our first initial six agents were located without the, throughout the state. So um, as I mentioned before, but it's a bit confusing, so I'll just reiterate it one more time. Um, we determined that NRCS was our highest bar for implementation funding. So um, we get that. Um, so for the pilot, we decided to 
pretty strictly follow this NRCS model. And since the pilot, we've kind of um, expanded this a little bit, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, the NRCS model divides ag production into two categories, landscape and headquarters. So simply speaking, headquarters is the buildings and operations. So, you know, everything that you see here from shops to um, to you know, kind of the, the stuff around, the stuff related to buildings, lighting, all those types of things. Landscape um, is production practices. Um, so what your cropping regime is, your irrigation practices, those types of things. So obviously things aren't ever really that clear cut, but it's kind of a starting point for, for how to um, divide up efficiency opportunities. So our agents went forth, they conducted their audits. Um, these audits took us to all the corners and borders of the states. Um, the picture on the left are my weird kids that um, I drag around all over the landscape to try and help me out with these things. Um, on this particular photo, we were at a, an organic multi-cropping um, a facility in the far north central part of Montana, which is called the um, the Golden Triangle. And so we had an organic farm. Um, over here, this picture on the far right, we have um, a gentleman who is um, talking to us about the really important factor of um, properly adjusting the nozzles on your irrigation system. Um, the picture in the center is from um, a facility that we went to in southwest Montana, and this particular um, ag producer had designed <laughs> this um, machine called the Love Machine, which was a, um, he designed it from scratch to, to kind of manual, to do the manual work involved with um, flood irrigation, and it kind of creeps down the creek or the irrigation ditch, and um, it goes slow enough so that the water can spill onto these particular areas that they need to irrigate. So it's just it was fascinating, and the picture on the bottom right is a grain dryer, um, which in some parts of Montana, and I'm sure in some of your states as well, um, does comprise uh, quite quite a bit of um, of the energy usage on farm. So one of our major findings of this pilot was kind of the duh moment that one of the primary drivers of energy consumption, and that's a really critical avenue for identifying energy efficiency and pollution prevention opportunities, is diesel efficiency and maintenance. And, and that was one thing that we found was not very well captured through the NRCS models that we used. Um, so it wasn't well captured in the training that we initially put together. And we remedied that this year. Um, with a training that we held um, with our MSU uh, Northern partners that have a, a complete lab um, that deals with energy efficiency. And one of the things that I learned after sitting through two days of diesel efficiency information is that, well, there's, it's, there's a lot to it. Um, so two days worth of um, diesel efficiency includes everything from um, and these are all factors that greatly affect the efficiency of the machinery and what the overall um, um, pollution and energy usage will be. Um, so fuel intake, exhaust, cooling, lubrication, electrical, wheels, tire, tires, ballasting, exhaust after treatment, all of these play a huge role in gaining the maximum efficiency that farmers can from their machinery. Um, we do have... Um, this training took place just last week, um, and we do we did decide to film it um, with a film student who is just looking for a few extra bucks, and um, and he filmed these uh, this video and or all of this training, and we've put it into different chapters depending on um, uh, um, on, on on the topic, and we've put that onto some training videos that we're now uploading to our site, and so um, I'll, I'll talk give you a couple pointers to where that stuff is or will be soon. Um, the other big opportunity for energy efficiency savings is in irrigation. So um, NRCS has some great irrigation efficiency models, which we used. Um, and we're now going beyond that um, in our next phase and releasing an actual flow meter so that we can go from predictions to realities. And um, this is another thing that we learned through the pilot that was actually very important. It's one thing to estimate what your irrigation system is doing understand what it can do, and then understand what it is actually doing. So um, um, this gives you very different metrics when you're analyzing what your um, 
gain can be by changing irrigation systems, by changing nozzle sizes, by going to different pump drives. Um, all of those are affected greatly by not just your predicted um, outflow of irrigation, but your actual outflow of irrigation. So just a couple of um, a couple of things to show you through these landscape evaluations. Um, normally when we do this kind of presentation, I have um, the ag extension agent that actually collected this information um, do this part of the talk, but he wasn't available. So, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily know all the ins and outs of this, but I think it's worthwhile just kind of giving you an overview, remembering that landscape, the landscape component of this is dealing with the irrigation and the cropping systems. Um, one thing that it's important to do with an E3 assessment is to gather that any data that's already been collected um, with any project, I suppose that's really important. So um, in this particular instance, they had done um, through their, um, through our uh, um, uh, utility, they had done an irrigation system audit report in the past in 2004. So this is really helpful in um, trying to identify um, what, um, what the velocity discharges were now, what they were before, and what type of efficiencies might be gained by, um, so for example, he had um, one pretty high bench that he was irrigating, not a bench like that you sit on, but you know, <laughs> a landscape bench that he was irrigating, and he was concerned that the, um, uh, that much of his power bill was um, was driven by um, his peak demand flow, and that peak demand flow does drive huge um, is a huge factor in the in the cost that a producer is paying. Now, if he's trying to drive um, the the water up to this bench, and and the pump has to be set at a certain level in order to um, to overcome the initial head pressure, then the um, then his peak demand drive is going to be very high. So were there opportunities for um, changing the system around a little bit that might be able to alleviate some of that? Um, for in figuring that out, um, because it's complicated, <laughs> any background information that you're able to obtain is, um, is very helpful. Um, so these are just some examples of, of, this, um, of this past audit report that we used for our, um, our E3 report. And you can see it, um, it, it gives you a nice graphical breakdown on um, your monthly energy use your, as, a, a, as a percent total of your total energy costs. Um, we used some of that data to put into um, an, this NRCS irrigation tool, which spits out some, um, some numbers for you. Um, if you were going to add a flow meter, what your system is using today, um, what it could be, and, and you know all of these. So you know whether you're adding a flow meter to your system, whether you're um, adding a variable speed drive, your analysis is going to change. So it's kind of built into these calculators. Um, as I said, the other component of, um, of the landscape evaluations is just understanding what the cropping system is, and this is a, um, and whether there might be efficiencies, whether it be diesel efficiencies um, or other types of, of labor gains um, that you might be able to, um, to gain from a change in your cropping practices. So this is the NRCS um, Cropland Energy Estimation Tool. It is amazing to me the work that has gone behind putting this together. And um, just another example of, you know, trying of just the benefits of utilizing some of these tools that, that are available. Um, the, um, the, the point of this particular um, of, of this particular tool is to understand um, what the d diesel usage is based on what the operation is, what the crop is, and what the operation description is. So any type of tillage, and um, this is all automatically calculated for you, depending on what type of tillage you're doing, whether it's a disc offset and it's heavy, or whether it's a harrow spike tooth, is going to give you a different amount of diesel usage um, based on the intervals of plowing. And so. Um, through this particular estimation tool, you can look at if you went to a no-till system, what your diesel gains would be, what your labor gains would be. If you um, 
if you moved, uh, and obviously there's other factors involved in, you know, move, um, going from an alfalfa brome to a, a triticale, um, it's going to depend on, you know, what the, uh, lots of different factors. But this just gives you one, um, kind of the, the straight up diesel efficiency, um, labor efficiency piece to that. Um, and this is taking the diesel piece of it, understanding the efficiency piece, and then this so nicely takes you to, which is, um, you know, for me in, in reporting our environmental outputs and metrics is really critical to, um, to our funder, who is the US EPA. So trying to go from, you know, what you're doing on the ground to the efficiency, the diesel efficiency gain to the greenhouse gas emission coefficients gained is um, I'm so happy that there were these brilliant minds that created these calculators because it makes our lives so much easier. Um, some of the headquarters considerations, and as I said, the headquarters is, you know, the stuff right around the house um, or right around the shop facilities, those types of things. Um, so it would include uh, this picture on the bottom right is a geothermal livestock water and ice preventer. So uh, this part of Montana is particularly cold, and I'm sure many of your states are as well. And this was um, kind of a unique um, way of keeping the, um, the water tanks ice free using geothermal heat. So no electric, no gas. And, um, and there are different ways that you can calculate the benefits, the environmental and energy efficiency benefits of, of those types of things. Um, aside from that, um, or those types of stock water tanks, um, lighting is a big issue. And so this is an example of the lighting worksheet that we used at one of the facilities, the Skinner Ranch, um, where you would go, we went through and and um, counted all or asked the, the, um, the ag producer. Sometimes they know this information, but usually they don't. Um, it depends how recent renovations might have taken place. But um, to record uh, the location, the lamp type, the wattage, the number of lamps and fixtures, the days used per, e days used per year, and the hours used per day. These are um, a list of lamp types or wattages that are typically found in agricultural enterprises and that are included in the tool that is then going to calculate, if you switch from this to this, what will you get? There's a lot of different lighting options. <laughs> it's amazing to me. Um, here is an example of um, the summary of recommendations that we have in our um, one of our final reports for, this is just for um, an upgrade in the lighting in the shop and grain facility. So this is the estimated reduction in energy use from whatever it was that this um, agent um, proposed. These are the energy savings, um, the costs, the installed costs, the energy cost savings, payback in years, and these are the environmental benefits that are associated with this one particular recommendation um, to upgrade the lighting in this one particular um, building at the facility. So you can imagine you can do that for, you know, depending on the size of your facility or, um, you know, for any kind of electrical usage, whether it's, you know, a milking facility, a coolant facility, whatever it is, um, these tools really can help you get to this nice little table that we all are trying to, um, that, that we all like to, to see it condensed. And it's really helpful in, in getting there. And this was all done through um, the NRCS headquarters tools. Um, here's an example of, um, you can't see it very well, but um, I just wanted to show you um, what some of the different identified projects could be So, um, in a farm operation. So these are some of the sort of the recommendations. And what we're trying to get at here is, you know, what was recommended, whether they actually did, or what, what specific project was recommended, what the Rec what the estimated um, return would be, whether that's cost or the kilowatt savings, on if they were to do that project recommendation. And then to do that final step of asking, well, did you do it yet? And you know, quite a few of ours haven't done anything yet because we're just 
kind of getting to that point and these things take time. Um, some of them weren't implemented, uh, some were. And so this just kind of gives you a way of looking at, um, at what some of those um, opportunities would be. So, um, you know, here's a 50 horsepower ditch pump rebuild, and this is your kilowatt savings and your cost savings potential. Um, others um, potential projects include installing a VFD, which is a variable speed drive, or a VFD or something like that. Anyway, those are quite um, popular now, or um, a kind of a new wave of um, of many of the um, of the irrigation pumps, and so there's a lot of efficiency that can be gained um, through the installation of these types of pumps. Um, so this, um, so through this um, pilot process, we also realized that there were some questions, and there are some pollution prevention. Well, there's many um, pollution prevention opportunities that. Um, that don't, they just don't kind of lend themselves to, like there isn't a calculator for it, there's not a, um, you know, it might be sort of difficult to quantify in tools that already exist. And one of the questions that comes up a lot, especially with users that are a little bit savvy, so for example, um, you know, the organic multi-cropping um, facility that we went to, well, they're already doing all of these amazing things for, um, as far as efficiency gains and pollution prevention for all the right reasons. I mean, they're all ahead of us, I think, in their thinking. And so it's trying to understand, um, so but someone from, even coming from that standpoint, um, will say, well, just, you know, we'd really like to go to more bio-based products, um, rather, um, you know, through in, in our shop facilities, and so what can we do, you know, what's a good way of, um, you know, or do you have any recommendations for, you know, what we can substitute product X with? Um, we want to be using something that's a little more environmentally friendly. So we put together this fact sheet. Um, we don't recommend any particular products. Basically, we're referring folks to the BioPreferred program, which is a federal initiative that is designed to um, increase the development and use of bio-based products um, from ag, forestry, and marine materials. So um, it's a U.S. Um, uh, federal initiative that has some great recommendations for um, bio-based products. So in this particular, so we put together this series of fact sheets. This one is just on bio-based products, but um, it's, it's pointing you, it's just trying to summarize, you know, what this particular tool could be that folks can go and use and how to use it. And these are all up on our website. I didn't print the whole thing. I just wanted to, I just put it here as kind of a reminder to, to, to talk about it a little bit. Um, another thing that comes up a lot um, is the issue of um, an SPCC plan. And this is a new regulation. It's a spill prevention control and countermeasure plan. That's now, these are now required for um, any storage facilities that have storage capacity over 1,320 gallons of any type of, um, of petroleum-based um, product or hazardous product. And so now anyone holding more than that, which is really very common, um, especially in our, our rural areas where um, access to fuel trucks and those types of things is not on, doesn't happen on a regular basis. Um, they so they are all required to have these spill prevention and control plans. Um, and so, what we decided to do in this fact sheet was to we did two different fact sheets. One on if you qualify, um, if if you have to develop a spill prevention control plan, an SPCC plan, um, you know, what are the, some of the steps in doing that? And if you don't qualify for that, what are still some of the common steps that you should take in order to, um, in order to make sure that um, that, that um, particular material isn't leaching into your groundwater or um, that you're not going to have a spill that, that, frankly, nobody wants. So we put together a couple of fact sheets on that. Um, let's see. So we, we have our... You know, we've done our assessments. We're we're good there. So now what? And um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, really, it's all just kind of um, 
a bunch of ink until things actually get implemented. And you know, we can talk all day about what those particular, what those potential benefits of swapping out the lighting in a um, in a farm um, barn are. But until it's actually done, nobody's benefiting. And so the next and really critical step is. Um, being able to match our project recommendations with funding mechanisms. And for those, so some of those include that I talked about earlier, you know, USDA, FSA, Rural Development, NRCS, um, the other E3 partners, Department of Commerce, Department of Ag. Um, but there's, and, and these are for those producers who want to pursue funding. There's many producers that hear NRCS and they're like, oh, no way. I don't want anything to do with that. For, for various reasons. Um, there are some that say, absolutely, I want to be involved with um, an NRCS cost share. But, and that's their decision. Um, but we want to be able to kind of provide them with a suite of different um, potential funding mechanisms. Because um, there might be one where they say, yes, I am willing to, um, to get involved with that. Because there are obvious synergies with many of these USDA programs. But what are the synergies with the other E3 agency partners? Um, so another example that's outside these partnerships is the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Funders. Um, those are, that's another potential funding source for folks um, that may be interested in pursuing, um, you know, something outside of the, um, of the USDA realm. So what has to happen in this, in this, you know, sector is to identify a good fit is to sit down and communicate with the local offices to get an indication of whether you're on the right track. So when I say offices, I mean the, um, the USDA local offices. So this is where the relationships come in, really come into play with your E3 partners. Because um, I don't want to sit, who is going to write the application for this, you know, the REAP program, for example? You know, it's pretty complicated. And, um, you know, is there somebody at NRCS that can, or sorry, at role development that could assist a producer with doing that. Um, is there um, a local um, office, we, um, I'm spacing on the name of them, but we have some um, economic, de economic development offices that will actually work with businesses, and that includes ag producers, to, um, to write grants. Is there, you know, is there a fit with, with that particular person? So, um, so that's, that's where sort of some of the relationship key comes into play. And, um, and thirdly, for projects that don't cleanly fit within a program, what are some other creative funding mechanisms, whether it's a private source like sustainable ag and food system funders, or whether it's something more state-based um, that, um, that might, or through your local utility. So um, once we have that laundry list of, um, of funding opportunities, those are all the steps you kind of have to go through with that. Um, we developed to help us with this because it's um, there's so many different opportunities and um, it can get a little bit um, confusing for those of us even that work in the, the grant realm. Um, we developed this, which is just one avenue for identifying what a good potential fit would be. Um, we developed this tool with an ag producer, extension agent, educator in mind. So somebody that wasn't necessarily um, an expert in um, USDA funding sources or any particular funding source for that matter. Can they just look through this online living document, this little brochure, and kind of start to narrow down the choices of where they might fit? Because um, the universe can be daunting it's, it, or of, of these potential um, funding sources. There's a lot of them. It's hard to find it in one place. And so we put this together. This is again on our website. And this is what it looks like. Um, this is one example of um, an FSA guaranteed conservation loan opportunity that I, um, I mentioned or alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, there's a brief program description. Um, we have example projects. Um, we talk about who's eligible, the funding amount, how and when to apply, and the link. So just the basic, like, is this, do I need, do I want to pursue this? Yes, I do. Where do I go? Not the be all end all, but just a, a way of getting you in the right direction. 
Um, here's a particular funding source all through, also through FSA, but that's not something that would kind of jump off the top as like, oh, this is conservation, this is energy efficiency, but it still is very applicable. These are FSA direct operating loans. Um, and if you read the description, um, the very end, it says it will also assist with soil and water conservation or to re or or to refinance debts with certain limitations. But um, the key part there is that it will also assist with soil and water conservation. So if you have a recommendation that's come through this process that fits um, within, the, um, within a soil conservation program, and that could be something like cropping, uh, change in your cropping regime, um, this might be a potential um, cost share or um, uh, lower loan opportunity. So um, just to kind of wrap it up, um, as far as program st um, sustainability is concerned, um, no one really understands the particular nuances and challenges for these diverse funding sources like the agency programs themselves. So we can make it easier to read through the basics like I was just showing you, but there has to be a relationship with the funder so that the, um, the ag producer who's, you know, going to, in the end, have to really um, put together these loan applications um, so that they can call the local rural development office, NRCS audits, and say that he wants to use his E3 audit results to apply for cost share on a variable speed drive. What program do I recommend? Uh, do they recommend he apply for? You know, what do they mean by question six on page 32? You know, those kinds of, like, we're getting down to the end here. You know, we're trying to, the producer is trying to, to get these um, recommendations implemented. And, um, and this relationship comes from the sort of the building. You know, this, this um, webinar that we're doing today, um, you know, working, um, you know, talking with the ag producers about, um, about you know, the fact that, um, you know, there are these variety of funding opportunities available, working with the, um, and it also requires um, an avenue of training within our, with our extension agents. It's not just energy efficiency, but it's what's this next step, what is the, what are the funding mechanisms that are available. Um, so we need to, you know, and part of our job is in coordinating, coordinating this is increasing the number of agents that are trained in all aspects of this process. Um, we are still recruiting um, for our next year. Um, this is just one of the little, um, and I'd be happy to share these and um, with anyone interested. And, and this is all on our um, E3 website, which is e3.peakstoprairies.org. But this is just a little um, pamphlet we gave to the agents to hand out at the different, you know, stock growers, stock growers association, um, you know, grain growers association, those types of things to to just. Um, to recruit um, additional um, ag producers. So we just kept it simple um, with what, um, what is involved with it and how they can benefit. Um, finally, um, one last thing that um, I just wanted to mention was that um, there are, this is a, um, a diagram, this is just kind of a zygote of an idea really at the moment, but it's a model that we think could be replicable that is starting to use what the idea that we've put together and kind of scale it up, scale it up a bit. And this is taking place um, along the Mississippi River. It's Lewis and Clark College that's piloting this, um, where they're using E3 and some additional funding sources and doing a dual track of, um, you know, how can they do these E3 assessments in manufacturing and in ag-related facilities at the same time. So it's kind of taking some of the stuff I initially discussed um, with, you know, the backbone of E3 and then adding this ag piece to it. And, and I'm happy to talk with anybody about that a little bit later. This is just something that's um, um, starting to develop in one particular area. Um, and with that, I guess in conclusion, um, you know, it's, it's, it hasn't been an easy process, I would say. You know, I think the rewards to the environment, our energy footprint, ag producers, the bank accounts, those are all indisputable, but there's a lot of moving parts, and identifying and bringing those parts together requires kind of this um, paid champion, I think. And, and for this particular project, we were awarded funds to, for, for me or for our program to, to take on that role. Um, but it is, um, but I think um, I would just you know, recommend or as, you know, if any of you are um, considering going through this in your states that, that there be that dedicated 
person and not you know some of your initial operating or grant funds go to this really full-time job and, and kind of getting it up and running. Um, it's a puzzle um, that is um, just it, it's, I, I think it, it brings the best of all the different federal partners together. And I think that's what I like most about it is that we're not creating new programs. We're just trying to leverage these really great programs, these really great tools, um, these really great funding opportunities that all of our federal partners have already developed and bring them together and kind of, you know, just make them work a little bit better, a little more efficiently. So um, with that, um, I'll just kind of open it up for if anyone has any questions for the last 10 minutes or so. Um, happy to take them. Okay, thanks, Myla. Um, Christine Anderson actually does have a question from USEPA Region 5. Um, she says, could you tell us more about the irrigation audits, i.e., who performs them and factors prompting farmers to have them done? Sure, okay, that's a good question. We um, Farmers are always, I would say that is kind of a good foot in the door because that irrigation is one of the huge um, energy outputs and um, money outputs for a farmer. And so, um, you know, because just it's, it's, a, um, it's just one of their main um, uh, points of, um, of cash outlay quite frankly with their with their um, with their energy bills and so usually um, they are more than willing and, and excited to to do an irrigation um, efficiency audit and the way that that can be done is through um, through your local utility like we show we, we looked at um, some of those um, worksheets that Northwest Energy our, uh, our local utility had done in 2004 but then we went back and we had um, well, we were in training, so we were we had a, a contractor who was an NRCS approved uh, contractor training our extension agents to do that very thing, and so it involves um, looking at the pump, you know, taking down the model numbers, looking at what the output is, um, ideally using a flow meter to take what your actual irrigation rate is. Um, versus the predicted versus the ideal for that particular pump. And so kind of combining all those factors. And so um, it can be done through an NRCS approved person. Um, there's a listing on the um, technical service provider. There's a list, uh, nationwide listing. Um, but it, but also, um, you know, what we're trying to do is, is to try to get our extension agents to that level. So that, um, and right now, they are doing the work, but with some oversight from these contractors. And so, um, but the tools that the NRCS provides, and that some other sources as well, too, provide can really help in, in getting answers to those questions. So once you know what the efficiency is, then you can play with, well, if I put in a variable speed drive, you can put that in as a factor, then what's my, what's my gain? Okay, we have another question, uh, which is kind of, it, we have another question that's kind of a follow-up to that, actually. Um, do extension faculty members become certified as te technical services providers for NRCS in order to, for the assessments to be utilized for USDA programs such as e EQIP? Mm -hmm. that, that's a really good question. Um, we, they can if they choose. So the EQIP program, um, technical service providers um, are not USDA, they are not NRCS personnel. So um, NRCS personnel is not, they have, they have designed this, uh, this program so that other people become technical service providers, not their own staff. So we're not taking away from, you know, we're not stealing their jobs or, you know, anything like that. It's um, that's how that this particular program has been designed. And so when we went through the pilot, we had a technical service provider that provided the oversight um, of our extension agents. And we gave the extension agents the option of, of becoming technical service providers if they so chose in the future. Um, going forward, we've worked really closely with our state and our CS office to um, and to with, with this project, and and they have said, you know, if it's an 
even if our they know that we're um, we're trying to get to that level of you know of of being on par with a technical service provider audit, and so even if we don't have a um, a technical service provider kind of rubber stamp it, then at least um, if if they know they've gone through kind of the E3 training and that type of thing, and if it's um, submitted to NRCS in Montana and it's um, it's it's um, involving something that. NRCS engineers are very familiar with, such as irrigation. Then, um, then that, that will be eligible for um, for uh, um, for equip funding. So it's it's kind of a long it's a, it's a lot of jargon, and um, I'd be happy to talk with you more about uh, that particular process too offline, and um, so I don't get uh, too hung up in acronyms and <laughs> and all these really like specific issues that I suddenly know so much about that I didn't know anything about two years ago. So, um, but yes, we do, um, they have that option of becoming a TSP if they so chose. The interesting thing is that there is one technical service provider that's qualified or maybe there might we might be up to three now in Montana. So it's a really small pool to choose from and this is why NRCS is really working to kind of outreach and, and to um, to identify more TSPs and um, at least more projects that are eligible for EQIP. Okay, are there any more questions? Oh, here's another one. Do water rights issues have a big impact on if irrigation efficiency audits resulted in implemented projects? Hmm, that's such a good question. I have not heard that come up in Montana yet, which is interesting. Um, so, you know, we have some pretty antiquated water law here. It's a use it or lose it, and it's a first in time, first in line. And so, um, one would think that the issue of the use it or lose it would would have come up so far um, with our ag producers, but it hasn't. And I haven't even thought about it till you just brought that up. So I'm I'm curious as to why. If there's um, you know if there's another potential source that these producers can use it for, or you know. I, um, yeah, I'm curious about that myself now that you mention it, but um, but so far it, it hasn't come up either in the training with the extension agents or um, with the producers themselves. So that's interesting. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay, and another question. Did extension staff feel like this was adding to their already busy schedules? Great question. Um, they, um, I think, you need some support from the higher levels. Um, we, um, you know, from some of the directorships, the, um, the regional um, department heads, that type of thing. I think for those that signed on, um, they we made it very clear what the requirements were. I think it's the tr it's the, the increased capacity of knowing that they get these questions when they're out in the field anyway. You know, they really, the producers really want to know how to save some money. And so they get these questions, they want to be able to address them. And so, you know, different, you know, we had some agents that frankly didn't, um, didn't produce for us <laughs> for the audit, you know, and then we had others that were complete rock stars. And so, you know, that has been um, another process of learning um, is that some just don't want to take it on, but some are already kind of, um, you know, dipping their toe in the issue of um, whether it's climate change or whether it's energy, uh, energy efficiency or whatever it is, um, are already dealing with that in their county. And so they want to be trained and they want to be able to provide that service to their um, to their producers, and so those are the ones that are really important to find. Okay, are there any more questions? Because we we had some good ones. Yes, we did. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think I think that's all. So well, see, seeing none, um, Myla, thank you so much for presenting today. I've really learned a lot. Um, okay, and I, please feel free to email me too if anybody has any questions. Of course, my contact information is not on my last slide, but it's, <laughs> um, you can get it from Laura. <laughs> yes, and um, and I have a link. I've already put links up 
on um, the Glipper website on the meetings page right under the uh, archived slides to the to the project website and that has contact information there so um, you should be good to go and I'll actually be adding the links that I was sending out while, while Milo was talking today um, I'll be adding those to the site as well so that people have a handy place to come um, again thank you for presenting um, one, um, as I said the presentation slides are available on the website's meetings page um, Look for a follow-up email tomorrow that is going to include a link to the archive webinar. We did record this today. And a feedback form. Please, please, please fill out the feedback form because that way I know how we're doing. Um, and we can also schedule more webinars that are of interest to, to, to our members. Um, the email, again, like I said, will include the link to the archived webinar. Webinar. I encourage you to share that archive link with your colleagues. Um, you know, the Great Lakes states have a very large agricultural base. Um, and I know we have some people from Region 7 on the call also. And the same goes for Region 7. And I think that using this technical assistance framework, using this model in, uh, in those regions particularly, could be really, really helpful down the road. Um, we will be posting the archived webinar to Glipper's YouTube channel. Um, it's going to take a couple of weeks to get the video converted and everything, but uh, I will send out a notice when that happens. Um, thank you again to everyone for joining us today, and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Laura. Yep, and Myla, if you can hang on a sec hang on until we're gone, we can. Sure. Great. Okay, thanks, everybody.